Um, good afternoon, everyone. We're getting ready to start our presentation. I'm Grace Mary Brady with the Bayside History Museum. I have a little bit of housekeeping to do before we get started. Please turn your cell phones off. This is being recorded. It will be YouTube. And if you go to whisper something to someone, it will pick up on the YouTube because this is our town hall and it's very sound sensitive. I want to thank our sponsors for this lecture, the Bayside History Museum, Calvert Library, and the Daughters of the American Revolution. I would also like to acknowledge uh, elected officials who attend our lectures on a very regular basis. Uh, Larry, would you stand up so everybody can see town council member from Chesapeake? Nikki Hummel is our own town council member. Um, uh, he's an IT genius, and we wouldn't have these lectures if he wasn't here. Okay, now I'm going to talk briefly about Vincent. Um, he's a graduate student in the master's program in historic preservation at the University of Maryland in College Park. He began working at the Bayside History Museum when he was in high school, May of 2013. He worked there all through high school, all through St. Mary's College, and now he's still with us through his master's program. His passion for history began with his dad, who's in the audience, Vince Turner. When Vincent was about 12 or 13 years old, his father asked him if he wanted to start doing reenacting with him. Vincent told him he didn't want to do Civil War because the uniforms were too itchy and hot <laughs> in the summer. And that's when they seemed to do most of the battles. So over the years, um, Vincent, his father, and his mom, and extended family, have participated in dozens of living history events, park cleanups, history days, and lectures. Uh, Vincent and his father also offer a live music entertainment show called Spam Time that features the music from the 40s through the 1960s. Several years ago, when Vincent and his father attended the D-Day Ohio event in Conewat, Ohio, it's the largest D-Day reenactment in the country and it features landing crafts, tanks, artillery, airplanes, and thousands of reenactors. Vincent joined an Army Ranger reenacting group which portrays members of the 2nd and the 5th Ranger Battalion. Through his research for his portrayal, he came up with this presentation that you're going to see today. As a high school graduation present, his parents paid for a trip for him to go to the National War, World War II Museum in New Orleans, and also to Normandy, France. So many of the photographs that are going to be part of today's presentation are from that trip. Without further ado, Vincent P. Turner. <laughs> Thank you, Grace Mary. That was a, that was a great introduction. Uh, and as she said, a lot of the photographs you're going to see in this presentation are photographs I actually took. So I can tell you exactly where I took them and what they represent and all the cool things that I got to see. I'd like to begin um, with the first slide here, um, with a few uh, elements. So I'll be talking today about the uh, Battle of Normandy, which if you're unfamiliar with uh, France, I included a map here. It's this red region right on the English Channel. Uh, there were 12 major allied nations which took part in D-Day, although many other countries um, had soldiers who were part of transportation units, support units, um, anything that you can imagine. There were men from all over the world and women too that helped to support this cause. The 12 major allied nations are represented by the flags up here on the upper left. I also included a photo of one of the Ranger landings there on the top right, and the Ranger diamond, which you can see here on my shoulder. The Rangers had this really cool insignia that was very distinctive and stood out to basically everybody on the beach. That uh, United States flag down there on the bottom right is actually from Normandy. It was flown on one of the landing craft which hit the beach at Utah. So, where do you begin? Well, we begin a basic training. Uh, 
for those of you who have been in the military, um, especially the Army, you'll recognize the, you know, the standard layouts of the forts. So on the left side there you see the, the barracks that they built at uh, Camp Forest, Tennessee. And that's where thousands of men were trained to become infantry. Rangers didn't start out as rangers, they started out as regular infantry. And the Americans actually were inspired by the British commando units. And they decided that they wanted units that were elite trained, the best of the best. And so from the regular infantry, you were selected into the program. It was all volunteer. There was no conscripts. There was no being forced into it. You had to want to do it. And that showed that you had motivation to go above and beyond the call of duty. So after the 2nd and 5th Ranger Battalions were formed at here at Camp Forest, they moved to Fort Pierce, Florida, which you can see on the right. This is where they conducted the amphibious training. And this was probably one of the hardest tests they had up until this point. Because they were landing in ocean swells, um, you had to deal with open ocean water, salt water, and then of course it's Florida in the summer. So it's like ungodly hot, ungodly humid, and all the bugs are carrying away all the blood in your body. <laughs> but if you made it through this training, you showed that you could persevere through anything. And so some of the uh, landing craft units that were down there were undoubtedly trained here in Calvin County. Um, this is our little connection to World War II. It's the Solomon's Amphibious Training Base. This is where landing craft personnel were trained on how to use those boats. Because many men who were conscripted or volunteered had never steered a boat before, had probably never even been on a boat. Could you imagine an Iowa farm boy who's been on a tractor probably and never seen water in his life that day and putting him in control of the landing craft? So this is where they would train. Um, that, there's a base map there on the right side. Um, it was a really huge facility, and today there's only about four structures left. Um, so not much. And then I found a postcard which showed one of these landing craft um, basically releasing a tank onto the beach there. But I always like to incorporate little local history into my lectures because we're all connected to this bigger world. Now, Normandy itself didn't occur in a vacuum. There was lots of things going on. Um, we think of World War II's beginning in 1941, because that's when Pearl Harbor happened and that's what dragged America into the conflict. But in Asia, Japan had been the aggressor against China since 1933. The, uh, the British and the French had been fighting the Germans since 1940, um, since 1939 really, when they invaded Poland. And there was a lot of concern that England was going to fall. With America's entry into the war, they knew that they would have the industrial might of the United States and plenty of manpower to back it up. But the real question was, how do you fight back against an enemy who seems insurmountable? There was a lot of question about how to get back onto mainland Europe. And so on the top left there, we have the Dieppe Raid, which occurred in August 1942. And the British were convinced that the way to get back onto the continent was to take a port city. This operation, Operation Jubilee, was a complete disaster. Basically, two out of every three soldiers who participated became a casualty. Either killed, wounded, captured, or missing. And from this, the Allies learned a valuable lesson. Don't take a port city. So, in um, late 1942, the United States launched uh, Operation Torch, along with some of the uh, British forces, which took place in North Africa. So that's a map there on the top right. And this is actually where the first Ranger Battalion went into action. They were formed in England with the commando units, and they saw action here in North Africa. Once the Germans and the Italians were pushed off the continent, they actually formed the third and the fourth Ranger Battalions there in North Africa. Uh, they took part in later Italian operations, so Operation Husky down here in Sicily, and Operation Avalanche, the actual invasion of Italy. And this is where the first, third, and fourth Ranger Battalions fought for the rest of the war. Now, the planning for Normandy went on for many, many months ahead of time. The Allies knew that they needed to land somewhere on the coast where they could get millions of troops, millions of tons of supplies, and move very rapidly. What they ended up doing was the British and the Americans put out these call for postcards, for tourist maps, for travel logs, from all the people who had visited Europe because those people were most familiar with these coastlines. I mean, could you imagine never having to think about, oh yeah, I'm going to invade Belgium or France. A lot of the British didn't understand what the coastline looked like, or nor the Americans. So it was from these tourist guides, these photographs, these postcards, these maps, 
that you're able to start piecing together what the coastline of Europe looked like. Now on top of this, you also had things like aerial reconnaissance photos, where you had airplanes with cameras in the noses, who would fly very fast, very rapid along the coast and take high definition photographs. So you can see the German defenses and their buildups. And from all of this, um, basically reconnaissance, the Allies came up with three ideas. Invade Norway, invade the Pas de Calais, which is the closest between England and France. I mean, you can literally see England from the other side, from the Pas de Calais, or Normandy. And they chose those because there were wide open beaches on all three of those places. Um, Norway was ruled out pretty quickly on because it's so far out, and then once you get there, what do you do from there? Uh, the Pas de Calais was ruled out because that's where the heaviest German force concentration was in all of East, uh, Western Europe. So they knew that that would be just a bloody slaughter if they tried to land there. However, in the build-up to Normandy, the Allies launched a lot of fake-out operations. They had things like um, inflatable tanks, they had fake airfields, they had fake army bases, all to convince the Germans that they were going to hit Pas de Calais, because that's where the Germans expected it. Instead, they chose Normandy. Normandy has nice, wide-open beaches. Um, it has a couple of ports, which you could attack from behind, and be able to hopefully capture all of that equipment intact and be able to land even more men and supplies. On the top right there, you can see a sand table. This is basically a high definition map of a specific area. Soldiers were given uh, a specific area that they were going to take on the beach and they were drilled on these maps. The Rangers especially, they had to take out this location called Point du Hoc which was a German artillery battery, which was feared would hold up the entire Normandy operation. The Rangers studied this table so extensively that even down to the lowest private, he knew exactly what the objectives were. So if their officers went down, if their sergeants went down, those privates, those corporals, those uh, private first class could go and take those objectives. Now facing the Allies were formidable defenses. Around 200,000 German troops were stationed in Normandy. These, however, weren't the top of the line. Um, there was fighting on the Eastern Front, and a lot of the younger artillery operators, flak operators, tank crewmen were sent to the Eastern Front to face the Russians. So a lot of reserve units, um, conscripts who were either too young or too old to be on the Eastern Front were here. You also had troops from the conquered countries, uh, people who were loyal to the Nazis, but who are not German themselves manning these defenses. On the beaches, you had um, thousands and thousands of obstacles. You had things like landmines, you had barbed wire, you had artillery bunkers, you had machine gun nests, minefields. Uh, the Germans themselves put these um, stakes down here along the waterfront, which they then proceeded to put landmines and artillery shells up onto, and so if a landing craft hit it, it would completely blow apart the boat. And so the Allies, after taking their aerial reconnaissance photos, realized that they would have to attack at low tide. The danger with Normandy is that coastline is so shallow that a lot of the landing craft on D-Day landed 300 yards out. So imagine wearing all that equipment you see over here, getting completely soaked wet through with salt water, and then running 300 yards through machine gun and artillery fire. It's, it's absolutely amazing that Normandy actually came off the way that it did. Now, inside the bunkers, the Germans had basically everything they could need. Um, they had things like infirmaries, so you could get medical attention without the threat of uh, being killed uh, by air attacks. They had armories where you could repair your weapons and store ammunition. These were scattered throughout the countryside so that if one were taken, the Germans could fall back to another armory and basically re-up themselves to continue the fight. You also had bunk spaces. Um, these bunkers here, were incredible. They were built uh, largely to what's called a B standard, which is six feet, seven inches thick of reinforced concrete. So imagine a wall that's probably about here, and that's all reinforced concrete, and that's what most of those bunkers were built out of. They could withstand 1,000 pound bombs, and they withstood a lot of the initial bombardment that the Allies put onto Normandy. These artillery bunkers here were incredibly dangerous to the Allied shipping. And these were prime targets for aerial bombardment and naval bombardment before the landing craft hit. They were protected by machine gun ports, um, which 
were also gas proof because there was fear that the Allies would use poison gas to push their way up the coast. Now, the Allies never used poison gas, but it was a widespread fear from World War I. And in order to get onto the beaches, you can't just kind of roll yourself off of one of those big troop transports. You have to actually land in one of these little tiny boats here. The Higgins boat, the LCVP, or Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel, was the workhorse of Allied landings in World War II. This ship could fit 36 fully armed men, so everybody having that equipment, you could fit 36 of them on one of these boats and land it. The initial waves that landed at Normandy were very fortunate because they got to load up on top of the boat, so up here on the boat deck, and then they got lowered down by crane. The guys afterwards had to climb down those cargo nets you see there. So could you imagine being on the side of a swaying ship? You have about 80 pounds of equipment on you, and you have to climb hand over foot, make sure you're not crushing the guy's hand below you, and the guy above you is not knocking you down. And then once you get to the bottom, the two ships are moving apart. So you have to time your jump into the boat so you don't fall in between. You get crushed between the landing craft. Now, the Rangers got special landing craft. They used something called the LCA, the Landing Craft Assault. This is armored. Um, you can see steel plates up here at the very front. The Higgins boats were completely made of plywood with only a steel ramp in front. So they were very vulnerable to small arms fire. But this steel plating here gave the Rangers some protection uh, during their run-ins on the beach. There's also another very important feature that distinguishes this from the Higgins boat. Anybody want to take a guess? Yeah, in fact. It's amphibious? Well, they're both amphibious. They're both boats, right? But it's, I like where you're going with this. It actually has to do with the troops, right? So on the LCAs here, they don't have this big ramp in the front. The LCA has a small little door here. You can see the hatch right there so you can run through. There was only one man getting off of that boat at a time. So imagine between 20 and 32 men crammed in this boat, and they could only get out one at a time. It was an absolute slaughter on the Omaha Beach. On the cliffs um, at Point to Hawk themselves, they were actually very fortunate that the Germans were pushed back due to the naval bombardment, and they weren't uh, basically shot as they came out of these landing craft. Now, the way these boats work is actually really cool. So I took a sequence of photographs here of a Higgins boat, what they would do is they would circle out of the water until everybody had gotten ready, and then they would gun their engines and go into the beach. At Normandy, they left um, about two hours ahead of time, and it took two hours to run into the beach. So I can only imagine the nerves of these guys at like 4.30 in the morning. They'd been up all night, because I don't know how you could sleep through you know, waiting to invade Europe. Getting into this boat, and then being rocked by one of the worst storms that the channel had seen in the years. So imagine one of these little boats swaying back and forth. It guns the engine. It's getting up, and it plows itself onto the beach here. You can see its bow <coughs> sticks out. And then they drop the ramp, and you run off. Now, these landing craft, what they would do is they would basically raise the ramp back up. They would gun the engine in reverse, pull off the beach, do a three-point turn, and then go back to pick up more troops. But remember, the sides of these boats are made of plywood. So that three-point turn is probably the deadliest three-point turn in the history of vehicle movement. Uh, they're completely exposed to machine gun fire, artillery mortars, and plenty of landing craft are actually destroyed on the beach themselves. Now, the typical soldier, uh, American soldier on the day, looks something like this. Um, so you can see a paratrooper here on the left side, and then just a regular infantryman there on the right. Um, the guy on the right there is a member of the 29th Infantry, who is actually in the overall command of the Provisional Ranger Group, which was the 2nd and 5th Ranger Battalions. Um, they were under um, General William um, Coda. And they were the ones that supplied them onto the beaches once they got um, to where they needed to be. And they also have something that I don't have because it's very expensive, these life belts. Life belts went here, so when you fell into the water, you would float up above. Some men ended up actually putting them down on their waist, which is where you think it should go. And because of the weight of all the pack, they turned upside down and they drowned because the weight of their equipment held them under the water. And then here's some photographs just to show you some uh, comparison and contrast to the Germans and the Americans. Uh, you notice the color, it's probably the most obvious thing here. 
Uh, but something else that I love to point out is that the German equipment is all leather. It's all made out of uh, cowhide, but with the Americans, it's all cotton. The Americans could mass produce all of their pieces of uniforms way faster than the Germans could. The German stuff, a lot of it was handcrafted, it took time. So there was a lot of equipment shortages, especially once the Allies started bombing their production facilities back in Germany. So the Americans were often better equipped than their enemies. Um, you can see gas masks here, because there was still that big fear that both sides would use poison gas, which luckily neither did. Um, but actually during the D-Day landings, sometimes the fire was so intense from the brush fires that people put on their gas masks to try and make it through. Here's some of the equipment, uh, the weaponry that was used. These are light infantry weapons. Um, so you have uh, the M1 Garand here, which is the standard rifle for the American infantrymen. Um, you also have the M1903 Springfield, which was the standard rifle just before. And you have the German K98s and their uh, assorted weaponry. I don't really focus too much on these because everybody likes to talk about guns, but I like to talk about the people. These are some of the um, heavier equipment that would have been brought onto the beaches um, during the landings themselves. On the left side, you can see um, mortars, you can see some of the lighter artillery pieces, and then the German defenders, they had things like landmines. They had all of these machine guns which uh, made up for the lack of troops in Normandy itself. We also had a variety of anti-tank weapons here, uh, rocket launchers, and then these are some of the anti-tank grenades that went on the rifles. And then the Germans were also um, scavenging weapons. From the conquered countries, they would take basically all the guns and rifles and whatever that they could use and give it to their reserve troops. And that way they could give the best and the newest to the troops that were on the front line, usually on the Eastern Front. So in Normandy, the Americans and the British and everyone else involved often faced weapons that were manufactured by Russians, or che um, Czechs, or Poles, or whoever, and they were using uh, capture equipment. <coughs> now the beaches themselves, there were five main landing points. The Americans um, had enough troops that they could actually have two beaches of their own, so they landed on the furthest west beaches, so you had Utah Beach, and then you had Omaha Beach. The Rangers, you can see you have that little, little diamond there, and here point to hop. And then the British, the Commonwealth, and the other allied nations landed over here at Gold, Juno, and Sword Beaches. You also had paratroopers, which landed behind the scenes to cause chaos. And they absolutely caused the greatest chaos that has ever been seen in one of these battles. Um, they were basically drop scattered, which meant that there was no coordinated units, there was no huge movement actions or anything. So the Germans had no idea where anybody was. They cut communications lines, they killed officers, they basically cut off the German high command. And so a lot of the fighting on DDA itself was determined by these paratroopers going in and knocking out the communications. You can see here, though, just how far the Allies pushed on DDA itself. The uh, British and Commonwealth troops had a lot better time than the Americans did at Omaha Beach here. Um, and even Utah itself was a bit dicey. There was no real firm line. Now these are photographs of the beaches at Normandy itself. That top left photo here, this is Utah Beach. So you can see that 300 yards of flat open sand. At Utah, the Americans are actually very fortunate. They got pushed off course by a stronger than expected tide, and they landed at a lighter defended beach. On Normandy, like D-Day itself, they only suffered about 200 casualties. This is the lightest um, of all five beaches. Then you have um, Gold and Sword Juno, they all, they look something like this. So nothing too crazy, but you can see the cliffs here um, looming overhead. And then this is the eastern flank of Omaha Beach. This is, I took it from inside an artillery casemate. So you can see it has perfect flanking fire down the beach. During World War II, none of this brush would be here. So that way you have a completely open field of fire. You'll also notice it's oriented sideways. And that was so when the Allies started bombarding, the shells wouldn't go directly into the artillery emplacements. It would hit that thick six, you know, six and a half foot thick um, wall. Now, where the Rangers landed is here, point too high. These top two photos I took from the very furthest you could get out on the point without falling off the cliff. 
the photo on the left here shows the, the west side. Originally, half of the second ranger uh, landing force, Force A, was supposed to land here. Uh, but due to a communications mix-up and not being able to see through the smoke, everybody ended up coming over here on the eastern side. These cliffs are 110 feet tall. So imagine coming up to this little cliff face. You have a 50-yard wide beach, and then you have to climb 110 feet to get up there and start fighting the enemy. Now, due to the communication mix-up, Force A, which landed uh, here at Point Two Hawk, was not able to communicate that they uh, needed reinforcements. So it was assumed on June 6 that the entire force was wiped out. And so Ranger Forces B and C ended up landing here at Omaha Beach, at Deerville. How many of you guys have seen Saving Private Ryan? That opening sequence was the Rangers landing here at Omaha Beach. That complete slaughter is exactly what happened to the 116th Regimental Combat Team, who were the larger um, unit on the beach. Company A, which was in the first wave, suffered 92% casualties. It's the highest of any unit at Normandy. I mean, it was basically just wiped out. Uh, Ranger Force B, which landed right next to them, so right about, you see where this, this wall is here, they suffered about 43% casualties. So imagine half the unit's gone in just the opening wave. The fifth Rangers, um, they came in on the second wave. They saw the, the slaughter that was going on at these beaches, and they actually moved further to the east. So they landed somewhere towards the middle down here. Um, there was a huge brush fire caused by the pre-bombardment, which was actually helpful. So 450 men landed there. Two or three became casualties, which is incredible for a force that size. Um, because the 5th Rangers landed in such good order, they were able to get off the cliffs and push back on the Germans and end that slaughter on Omaha Beach. Um, you can also see the tides here. So this is high tide. And then this here is about halfway. So this is, I mean, I couldn't say the whole time it's like a 12 hour, you know, 12 hour difference. But the beach goes out to usually about right here. So imagine having to run across that whole thing while being shot at, bombed at, and just having all that kind of chaos. Now Point to Hawk itself was important because of this artillery emplacement. There were six gun pits which mounted 155 millimeter cannons. Uh, they were, the pits looked just like this, they were open, so that way they had 360 degrees of fire. Uh, but because the Allies wanted to invade, they knew that they would um, have to get through these defenses, and they started bombing them uh, with aircraft pretty early on. So the Germans came up with these artillery bunkers. Uh, they offered a 120 degree arc of fire, which is still pretty good, uh, but it does limit your side-to-side -side fire. So two of these gun positions were left to look like this, while the rest were encased in reinforced concrete like this. And you can see just how thick that ceiling is. And even though it's been bombed, it was still effective on D-Day itself. Uh, you have up here, this is the command bunker. This is on the, uh, this is the observation post at the very tippy of Point Du Hoc itself. Unknown to the Allied planners was that this was an army artillery battery. Now the army and the navy in the uh, German military didn't get along. They had completely opposing doctrines. They didn't agree on anything at all. So the army often built their own bunkers, the navy built their own bunkers, and then the air force built their own bunkers, and they very rarely communicated um, or even shared technology. As it turns out, the um, the platform for the range finding equipment is up here. It's completely open. So it was open to air attack, open to being shelled, and the army equipment was actually so poor that it couldn't hit moving targets. So it turns out that this artillery battery wasn't as big a threat as they thought. But to the Allies, having six 155 millimeter cannons shooting at you with an unknown about, um, it's just, it's a danger that they couldn't risk. And here's a photograph of one of these cannons. Uh, they fire a 93-pound ar uh, armor-piercing shell. This is powerful enough that you can sink battleships. And this is what the Allies were fearing would hold up the entire operation of Normandy itself. And just a fun fact, the Americans also used the 155-millimeter cannons. They used them as divisional artillery. Uh, but they had coast artillery here in the US that used them as well. Now, in the build-up to uh, Normandy, like I said, they had lots of air raids. So you can see some of the medium bombers here. Um, and this is actually Point Du Hoc. 
you can't even see the point. It's just being completely obliterated. Uh, beginning in April 1944, the Allies launched um, several air raids specifically targeting this point. But to keep the Germans guessing at where they were going to eventually invade, they bombed the entire coastline. So there wasn't this concentrated just on this one point or just on Normandy. There was bombing everywhere to keep the Germans guessing. That photograph on the right here, this is Pointe du Hoc. This is what it looked like in 1944, right after the battle itself. I mean, it's just, it looks like a moonscape. I mean, it's just completely obliterated, craters everywhere. And um, on D-Day itself, there were 115 heavy bombers dedicated specifically to hit this point. And they dropped a little over 600 tons of bombs just in the opening hours of Normandy. And it basically wiped out what would have been the battery. Um, and it turns out that because of all of this bombardment, that the Ger Germans had actually moved the artillery down here into a field. Uh, away from all of this destruction. On D-Day itself, um, a specific task force was created for the Navy, which had the USS Texas, which you can see here, the USS Arkansas, and several cruisers, which were dedicated solely to bombarding Point Du Hoc. Uh, the Texas had 14-inch four, guns, which fired shells, which were about 1,500 pounds. So imagine 250, 1,500-pound um, you know, shells slamming into there. Um, the after-action reports where the Allies were actually interrogating the Germans who were captured said that almost all the artillery crews were deaf or concussed or knocked around in their bunkers from this bombardment. Um, they still put up uh, quite a fight afterwards and they moved in lots of troops um, to help hold on to the peninsula itself. Now the fighting at the beaches was absolutely ferocious. This is a photograph of one of the landing craft actually coming in at Normandy itself. You can see all those guys jammed in there. So imagine you and 35 of your best friends. You're smelling great because you just spent the whole night in another ship and you thought you were going on the day before. There's a storm off the coast. You're being rocked around. I can only imagine the fear and just the adrenaline rush of coming in on these beaches themselves. And on Omaha Beach, as we all know, it was an absolute slaughter. I mean, hundreds of casualties in the opening waves. The fighting was so bad that few photographs actually survive of the day itself. This is probably one of the most famous photographs of Normandy. This was taken at Omaha Beach itself. Here's a photograph of uh, collecting some of the bodies afterwards. Once the uh, bombardment had stopped, once they had actually pushed the Germans off, there was time to collect the dead. And it's just, it's absolutely devastating seeing these images to me. But once those beachheads were secure, once those Germans had been pushed back, the Allies were able to land all of these men. I mean, just look at all these ships, just as far as the eye can see. Thousands of boats, hundreds of ships, waiting to bring supplies, waiting to bring reinforcements onto those beaches themselves. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. This is probably my favorite photograph of Tito. And that's because you can see these little tiny boats here. Those are the Hagen boats. Uh, and then you have some of the other lighter landing craft here. But just imagine you're one person in that boat going up to the coastline. Above you, thousands of aircraft flying, engines roaring, bombs exploding, the coastline on fire, smoke enveloped. I mean, it must have been like hell on earth. And then you're sitting in a boat for two hours getting tossed around, getting soaked. And you have to go run up a beach, you have to climb a cliff, and you have to fight somebody who wants to kill you. I, mean, I think this photo just encapsulates that pretty well. You feel so small in this big world. This is some of the uh, Ranger reinforcements. Um, so like I said, Ranger Force A, which actually landed at Point Du Hoc, was thought to be wiped out. Um, their radio communications equipment all failed, except for one radio which was only tuned to the Navy frequencies. And it was the Navy that kept them alive, that kept saying, no, we need to send troops and reinforcements. So the day after the landings, about 60 Rangers were pulled off of Omaha Beach and landed at Point Du Hoc, and that's what you see here, bringing up more supplies, equipment, and food. And then here you can see even more reinforcements landing on Omaha. I mean, these guys look just like they've seen hell. It's absolutely inspiring to meet some of these. I've actually met some of the Rangers who were there at Normandy. 
So the rangers themselves, they learned a lot from the commandos. The commandos were specialized British units which raided the coastlines everywhere from the Spanish border with France all the way up into Norway. And the, rain, and the Americans wanted units that were exactly like this. So they trained with the uh, commandos in England uh, itself. And then for Normandy, they came up with their own equipment to take on those 110-foot cliffs. They used what were modified depth charge launchers, um, so basically two-inch rockets. You can see one here, which had a grapple hook at the end. So on the landing craft assaults, you can see them launching some of these rockets here. There are six rockets. The first two fired a three-quarter inch rope to hopefully get to the top of the cliffs. The second pair fired a three-quarter inch rope with wooden toggles to give them a handhold. And then the third set actually fired a rope ladder to the top of the cliffs. Now, of the landing craft that made it to Point Du Hoc, there were 54 of these projectors. Only 19 of them actually got grapples to the top of the cliffs. I mean, that's a pretty spectacular failure. I mean, that's less than 50%. But still, uh, from the pre-invasion bombardment, huge sections of these cliffs have been knocked out. And the rangers were able to assemble uh, small tube ladders and actually put it at the tops of these so they could rapidly climb up. Um, there wasn't a lot of resistance at the lip of the cliffs because of the naval bombardment. Whenever the ships actually saw Germans up there, they would just start shooting as much as they could. And of course, the Germans aren't stupid, so they're not standing on the lip, on the, the lip of the cliff shooting down. Um, there were also landmines and other explosives, which were basically exploded by the bombardment. Um, so landing at the cliffs itself wasn't too bad. The Rangers were also highly trained in explosives. Um, you can see Composition 2 here. This is what they were um, using to breach the bunker doors and clear out the insides. Um, you can see here, these are Bangalore torpedoes, which are basically long tubes that are filled with explosives. And this was used for clearing barbed wire, because you could shove this tube up underneath a whole apron of barbed wire and blow it sky high. And then I wanted to include this so you can see what the ropes are that I was talking about. So you can see one of the ropes here, the three quarter inch, here's the toggle rope. And then, whoop, one more. And then the, rope, the ladder here, the small tubular ladder, which is connected up here at the top. This was taken on um, D-Day plus two. So you can see these guys are a little bit more nonchalant about getting up there. You can see they're not scrambling. But it's absolutely amazing to imagine these guys climbing up this while under fire. Now, Point Du Hoc itself was completely obliterated by the fighting. Um, these top photos here, um, I took at other uh, bunkers uh, in Normandy itself, but you can see, I took this from inside one of the artillery bunkers. Remember what I said, this is a six foot thick reinforced concrete wall, and an artillery shell still got through and probably killed everybody inside. I mean, the fighting is ferocious. This is what the artillery would have um, looked like at one of the sister batteries, and then you can see some of the battle damage just on the face of this casemate here. Those clip, uh, those, um, craters that I showed you, where all those little circles on Point Du Hoc, this is what they actually look like. And this has been filled in because of you know, rain basically carrying soil in. So these were probably about 20 to 30 feet deep on D-Day itself. Um, you can see one of the bunkers got completely obliterated in that pre-major bombardment. Uh, I actually went down into the bottom of one of these, and so, I mean, just imagine a crater that's higher than the ceiling of this room. And that's what these guys were fighting in. The fighting was so bad that they actually had German and American patrols, which would hop from crater to crater, and they never saw the other side. One of the Germans um, who was captured at that point in time stated that he never saw an American the entire uh, day of D-Day itself. He just heard the rifle fire. So it's almost like going back to World War I trench warfare. Now, this is a much more detailed map of basically the Allied positions at the end of D-Day itself, end of June 6th. And you can see the uh, British Commonwealth forces were doing pretty well over here in the east. There's a German counterattack on D-Day itself, um, which was quickly repulsed. You had a confused situation over here on Utah Beach in the very west, and then you can see Omaha Beach here, where you can see the most resistance. This is where the Ranger Battalions landed. So you can see 2nd Ranger Battalion landed here at Point Du Hoc. And then this is where I took those photographs of Omaha Beach. Um, so Dog Beach here, 
is where the 116th and the 115th uh, Regimental Combat Teams landed, and the rest of the 2nd and 5th Ranger Battalions. This was the most heavily defended section of the entire coastline, and the Americans paid for it in a lot of blood. Now, once the uh, Point to Hawk had been taken. The uh, artillery pieces were actually found on D-Day themselves, and they were blown up using thermite grenades, which is basically uh, grenades that burn at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So they completely melted down the sights on these and the elevators. So they were completely inoperable. The Amer um, Americans had to fight desperately to hold on. The Germans launched several counterattacks, which actually reduced the original force, which was about 200 men, to 90 by the next morning. They were reduced further down to about 50 or so um, by DA plus two, which is when the rest of the second rangers and fifth rangers broke through and actually relieved that force on the, uh, the cliff itself. And once the allies had gotten through the beaches, they encountered hedgerows. I'm sure you guys have heard about hedgerows before, and it was you know basically these plants that were growing up along farmers' fields. Um, but hedgerows are completely beyond description that you read in books. You actually have to see this in person. It's, it's incredible. They've been built up over centuries. The French farming techniques basically pushed soil to the edge of their fields, which built up in these little hills here. So the original ground level is probably about here, and it's all been built up. And the fighting basically bogged down. I mean, from Normandy itself, the uh, Allies hadn't anticipated this. They figured, oh, we're just going to breeze through the countryside. We got lots of countryside back in the U.S. We'll be able to push through. But the fighting was, it was intense. There were Germans and Americans on the other sides of the same hedgerow. Um, this photograph here on the left, there's actually two gun barrels sticking out. I bet you can see one of them, right? So the Rangers, yeah, my guys probably would have shot him immediately, right? But there actually is a second gun barrel sticking out of the hedgerow here. It's down here in the dark. And this is what you're fighting against. Every single one of these natural fence lines you see here has this going on. Has machine guns, has hidden artillery, has landmines. And it took months for the Allies to try and break out here. I really love this photograph because it gives you some perspective of what these hedgerows actually look like. I mean, you're not pushing a tank through that. You're not pushing a truck through that. It's just absolutely stunning. So the battle for Normandy itself actually lasted until August. So June 6th, all the way until August 1st is when the Allies were finally able to break out. Months of vicious fighting. But once they did, it was basically a torrent of troops flowing through. You can see these rapid action lines of troops moving through. The Ranger battalions were actually used over here in Brittany to take out some of the uh, coastal forts and to help the uh, Allies conquer some of the port cities themselves. Now, remember what I said about those wide open beaches? Good for landing troops and supplies and everything. The Allies had expected that they were going to take some of the port cities. But what the Germans did when each port was about to fall was they blew up all of the harbor facilities. They sunk ships in the harbor. They basically ruined them for any use. And then they surrendered. They said, OK, guys, we're done now, after they completely ruined the facilities. And so what ended up happening was that even, though, even when the Allies were pushing into Germany itself, Supplies were still being landed on the Normandy beaches and being trucked into the frontline troops. I mean, hundreds of miles just driving over just to give um, supplies to those frontline troops. Um, the Allies had expected to maybe not capture a port so quickly, so they actually brought their own. These are called mulberries, and they're artificial harbors. They basically brought caissons and old ships and sunk them as breakwaters. And then they had all the supply ships landing inside, landing at the docks here, and bringing in supplies. The American uh, mulberry was actually destroyed um, just uh, shortly after it was put into place by another uh, channel storm. So all of the supplies were brought in using one mulberry, and that was on the British beaches themselves. These cities in Normandy itself were completely devastated. This is a photograph of St. Lowe. Not a single building survived intact, the entire city. And this happened to Caen as well, and Cherbourg was pretty devastated. So all of these cities are completely wiped out. If you go there today, it's all 1950s architecture, basically, or unless they like rebuilt something to look like it did before. Um, you can see some of the casualty counts here. Uh, the German casualties are an estimate. 
because a lot of their records were destroyed in combat. So there is no certainty about how many were actually at Point Two Hawk, how many were at any of the beaches, how many reinforcements were rushed in, or what um, sack, you know, how many people were killed, wounded, or missing. And you can see the Utah Beach there, just under 200 for the casualties, and then Omaha Beach here itself. I mean, 2,500 out of 6,000 men landing on that first day. I mean, it's absolutely devastating. And Normandy today is extremely peaceful. When I visited uh, France, I spoke a little bit of French. I took some French in high school, so I was like, oh, I'll get to this. Now, high school French had nothing on actually being there in person. But they're the nicest people you'll ever meet. Wherever I went, they tried to work with me, and I tried to learn a little bit of French to, to go with them. And the museums there are incredible. So the Allies, basically when their equipment would break down, so you can see an artillery piece here, they would leave it because they could just bring in a brand new one. And behind it, everything from tanks, airplanes, trucks, artillery, even weapons. And they basically left it all over the countryside as the fighting continued because their supply lines were so fantastic. The Germans didn't have that luxury. And every vehicle they lost, every artillery piece they lost was devastating. So really it was the Allied industrial might which helped to liberate Europe. It was also the men that gave their lives. You can see, the, I took photographs of the American cemetery here, which is just off of Omaha Beach, and then this is a German cemetery. You'll notice the, the differences in color. Well, the German cemetery it isn't celebration, it isn't commemorating the dead, it's remembering. It's it's recognizing that they were men who were either conscripted or volunteer or fighting, but that they're still human. But it isn't a celebration of their service, like it is with the American. Um, this monument you see here is the Ranger Monument at Point and Hawk. This was dedicated by Ronald Reagan. Um, and his speech was actually very moving when I read it. Um, and the monument itself was really cool to see in person, um, especially at the scene of such sacrifice from these men. Um, one of the markers that I thought was really cool, which I'd never heard of until I went to France, are these liberation markers here. You'll notice it says kilometer zero zero. This is the beginning of the liberation of France, the beginning of the liberation of Europe. And so they have these markers to show where the Allies came to push out the Germans. And there's other kilometer markers further in, into France which show the progression of the Allied armies. But I think it's really cool to be able to sit here and say, this is where it all began. And with that, I want to thank you guys for coming. Thank you for asking. I'll do my best to uh, give you an answer. Yes? Where did you meet some of the survivors, etc.? Yeah, so um, I do living history and reenacting. So I've been to really big events. They have like a Reading World War II air show, which is usually actually on uh, June 6th, or at least as close as they can get it on that weekend. And they would bring out as many veterans as they could find. And they had this huge airplane hangar where they would all sit around and talk and you know sign things, or maybe they had books, or people had written books about them. So um, I actually met a Pearl Harbor survivor there. He was on the USS Arizona when it blew up. Which, I mean, I was a fan, he was a cool guy. Um, but I met some of the Rangers there, and then at Conneaut, um, they had DDA Ohio. Um, they actually had some of the Rangers from the Second World War who would come and hang out with the guys who were dressed up in uniforms um, and just sit and talk. So I did get to meet a few th uh, through that. Other questions? That's really good though. If you guys don't have questions, that means I answered everything. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> So uh, Vichy was uh, basically a Nazi puppet state. It was France that wasn't conquered. Um, but there was worry uh, by the Germans that they were eventually going to turn over to the Allies once the Allies had landed in France. And so Vichy was actually um, officially taken over by the Nazis and um, was no longer a state by the end of 1944. So um, 
The French collaborators themselves, it's really hard to gauge um, because a lot of the after war uh, basically actions where the people who are the resistance basically shot all of the male collaborators, the people who were accused of collaborating. So it's really hard to tell what role they had. I mean, it's hard to tell the dead guy. Uh, but there was widespread fear in the resistance that they would be turned in and that they wouldn't be able to continue all their sabotage and the raids and um, aiding the allies. So there was a lot of fear of, you know, is my neighbor going to turn me in? Are they secretly working with them? Is there a question back? Yeah, um, what, when um, the Germans were in the there, the German soldiers who were sent to uh, uh, to defend the beaches, mm -hmm. they were injured, right? And so, did, were, did were they prone to like surrendering quicker and not giving up as much of a fight? Well, then, yeah. mm -hmm. that's a really good question. Um, so the quality of troops in Normandy itself varied. Um, it was more of a unit by unit thing. Um, they had SS units who were there, who were very fanatical and dedicated to the cause. They also had conscripts, so they basically, um, when the Germans conquered a country, they said, give us 20,000 men, and they made their own units. Now those guys were very liable to just throw their weapons down and surrender, because they're like, I'm not going to die for these, and they would turn themselves over. Um, they actually had like uh, Italian laborers who were working on the coastal um, defenses, who once the Allies got close enough, they said, okay, yeah, sure, I'll come over with you guys and they surrendered themselves. There were also um, Russian conscripts who were brought over to work on the defenses, and they were very liable to surrender in the beginning, too, um, because they weren't going to die from the Nazis. Um, so it really varied by the units. Um, the resting and recuperating units, it just depends on where they were at. I mean, if you're facing overwhelming Allied firepower, you're probably going to try to surrender. Yes, um, another one? My, no, my next question is, is that so the SS Panzer Division back by that tip around what do did they get trapped there and had to surrender? Yeah, so there was actually, um, in Normandy itself, you have the Cote and Ten Peninsula, um, which was completely cut off by the American forces. And the Germans were gradually pushed all the way back into the city of Cherbourg, um, where they held out for a little bit longer, but eventually they realized the game was up and they surrendered. Um, so all the Germans that were caught back there um, did end up surrendering or were killed. Very good questions. <laughs> Just invite people to see your collection. Yeah, and I have um, I brought some of my reenacting um, gear here. Um, I'm a little bit bigger than they were back then, so a lot of my uniform stuff is reproductions. Um, I wish I could fit in original things, um, but I do have um, some original gear that I brought with me uh, for the display. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask me as well.